Welcome to the Manufacturing Masters Podcast with your host, Allison DeFord. If you're an original equipment manufacturer and your aftermarket and advanced services aren't making up at least 30% of your revenue and profit, you may be leaving money on the table, my friend. Today's guest is helping OEMs do just that, growing those parts of your business to increase your revenue and your profit. And he claims the time to value usually starts within just three short months. I kid you not. Our guest today is Sam Cladman, founder and principal advisor of Middlesex Consulting. This guy has been around the block. He's got the most amazing stories and I just can't help but learn every time he opens his mouth. It's incredible. An endless font of wisdom and experience and just a really great human. So join me today in investing some time in yourself, your business, your team. Spend a little bit of time with Sam and I as we dive into how to help you grow your aftermarket and advance services to create greater revenue and profit. Everybody, here we grow. So Sam, I'm so glad that you are here today. This is going to be such a fun episode and I love it when end of the day, your whole, I feel like mission is it's to help manufacturers make more profit and be of better service to their customers. Yes, us create value, more value for their customers. And as a result, uh, create more retention and growth for themselves. Love it. Well, right. and I love you've got a you've got a saying, and I, I know you are a, as a consultant and you're an expert on the manufacturing masters platform and have many great videos about helping OEMs grow their aftermarket and advanced uh, service revenue and profit, like growing those departments to grow your revenue and your profit. And you have this wonderful saying, time to value right. usually starts within three months. Right, right. That's and big. So it, it, it's, a, it's a much better, quicker ROI, a much, much quicker payback than paying for a new three axis or six axis CNC. Right. And because service is not tangible. So you, you don't have to buy, bends, hammer, treat, machine, assemble, test, put it all together and run it. You, you have to know what you're doing. You have to have a an intelligent, qualified person working with your customer and they go out and do their job very quickly. So, I mean, it's a different situation. Well, and I've heard you say something that I I think is so smart. You talk about the difference between the manufacturer provides the part. Product. Right? Uh, and product. Product. The value comes into play when the person uses it. Right. Like expound on that for a sec. So the reason we buy things as a, individuals or as companies is because we want the value we're going to earn by using the product. Now, I mean, the value could be tangible and we'll make a bunch more money, or it could be intangible. Um, I will have a much safer envi environment for my employees, or I feel good about myself, or, or all kinds of different things. But that's the value. I mean, the only thing that I know of that, that always comes to mind is that you buy and get value from without using it and without touching it is you're looking at art. 
Mm -hmm. You look at a painting on the wall, okay, and feel good. And then you say, hmm, I own that. <laughs> and you feel better. But other than that, if you're buying any equipment, sitting it in the corner of the uh, of a room or in the shop floor and having it sit there collect dust, there's no value that you're creating. Turning it on, turning out product, faster, better, higher quality, extra capacity, that's real value. And you'd only get that when you're using it. So I think that, that I, you know that, that the linkage between the operations, the manufacturing, engineering, sales side, and there's service side is really critical because of the feedback that the service people provide and and because they are working with customers. I mean, there are studies show that service people spend more time talking with customers than salespeople do. You know, once the order's there, sales guys might come in once a year when they're planning the fourth quarter rush. But other than that, nah, how you doing? Yeah, good. Everything okay? Yeah, great. Tick it off and make a note in Salesforce. But the service guys will go in and spend days working on equipment, working with customers, teaching them how to use it, how to do self-service, and also looking around their operation and finding ways that the customer can improve their operation and, uh, and bless you, and, and sharing them with the customers. So, I mean, it, it's, it, it's two sides of the same coin, but the the money side, I think, is really on the service side. And do you feel like that the service side is not being adequately developed and executed on so that what I mean by that is that most OEMs have a real opportunity here to take advantage of your framework and your expertise and really tune into this conversation. Well, absolutely. So but I, I have recently did a whole bunch of statistic crunching, and I came up with four numbers that I think are really important for the OEMs to understand. So if you don't mind, uh, the first number is absolutely. that, uh, and these are all based on 2023 financial results that I went through the 10 case. Okay. Uh, okay. First thing is that uh, service revenue on an average is 27 to 30% of total revenue. And the number I recommend people thinking about is really 30%. Okay. Service profit is somewhere on the order of 37% of total profit, net profit. So, so you got to... A lot of revenue contributing and more profit. Uh, I looked at service margins and product margins. Product margins are typically over a whole bunch of industries are typically around 30, 31 percent on average. And service that's product service margin is around 36, 37 percent. So. So, so those two, th those are four things, and then you say, where is the product growth potential? And you say, man, well, it's kind of hard to make new stuff, really new you know, benefits and features and improved outcomes. That's hard to do. It's expensive and it's incremental and slow, and the customers are really keeping their older stuff because it's working and. Mm -hmm. you know, they depreciate it now, so it looks great on a balance sheet. So it's hard to grow rev uh, revenue from the product. But service revenue is relatively untouched. There's lots of upside. So you can uh, focus on the aftermarket for high growth of high margin, high revenue and, and profit-producing services. 
No, I, I think, you know, it's just a, yeah, I don't want to say no brainer because that's insulting people who haven't done it. <laughs> but no, uh, I think it's a good solution. No brainer meaning this shouldn't be something you have to dwell on very long to decide. That's right. Oh, let's take advantage of this. Right. Absolutely. I, well, I want to, before we, we're going to talk about two key points today. We're going to talk about how do you hire the right field service manager and then also developing your field service rep. And before we do that, I think it's important to set a little context. So, you know, I know in, in most industries, but especially in this one, we have a lot of titles and uh, things that words that get thrown around a lot. And I don't know that everybody always maybe understands exactly what they all mean. So do you want to set some context for us in terms of what does the field service, you know, let's talk about what does that person do or however you want to lead us into like, let's talk about the nuts and bolts of this department before we jump into the department. Yeah. Okay. So, so the service department has a bunch of functions uh, and I'll list a couple of them. Yeah. They have to, they take care of logistics. Uh, they, they s sell, use, return spare uh, parts. They go, they have dispatching, sending engineers out to customers. They train customers both on operating equipment and repairing it. They have call centers where they get the initial calls from the customers with problems, try to solve them uh, without dispatching anybody. And they have salespeople who are selling service products and marketing people who are creating the products. And, and in between, they do some pricing. Uh, so those are the typical functions. And so you do, the head obviously manages all those. Plus, the, a, a, a good organization will take the head of the service organization, whatever you call them, mm -hmm. and get them out in front of prospects. I, mean, I know when I headed a service organization, I spent a lot of time on airplanes visiting with our sales guys and going into customer uh, prospect accounts. And if they didn't want to talk, they, they understand the products. They, they say their concern is what's going to happen when it breaks. Right. That's what they care about. You know, that, that's the value it taught them, the, the long term value. So a big part of the, the, the job description for the head of service needs to be a good communicator. Right. And and I can go with stories, but I'm not today. But So that's the context and that's what's going on. So a okay. person like that, you know, we used to talk, uh, up until about a couple of years ago, we always talked about hiring for attitude, training for skill. Okay. That. that was the, okay. Now that's changing very quickly. It's higher for skill because we don't have anybody available to train for the for the skills. So, so you know, we're changing that. But for the head of a service group, I honestly believe you got to hire for the attitude. You have to have a person that's that's hot salesman, saleswoman, mm -hmm. salesperson, mm -hmm. and hot uh, technician, a technical person. You need a real, a strong balance between those two because you're going to find that you're going to want them out there talking with prospects and working with prospects. Good point. So they've got to have excellent communication skills and customer facing because sometimes those are two different things. Right. Right. I, mean, I, I came from manufacturing and, uh, I had been a, the director of manufacturing technology for a high-tech company. And then when the VP moved over for a six-month stint as a head of engineering, I took his place. 
And then he came back and I took my old job. And then a couple of weeks later, the CEO came to me and said, you know, we're having problems with our, then this, this is confidential. We're having problems with our service head and he's going to disappear. Would you like the job? And I, I sort of sensed that was coming. And, and I thought about it. I said, I really would, but I have two concerns. One, I've never managed people remotely. And two, I've never been intimately involved in the sales process. And he said, ah, don't worry about it. You'll do well. <laughs> and, and so I did. And, and, and that's what I wound up doing. So, I mean, you, but you need those, you know, you need both of that, those sides. Yes. And you have talked um, about, well, I want to back up for one minute yep. before we get into, uh, you've given like five good points about hiring the right field service manager to support what we were just talking about. But just to back up for one minute, I love the story that you tell in one of your videos on the platform. Uh, a, it's a tactics story. And I think this is very important because you recommend designing for your organization, number one, and number two, always being prepared to reorganize and start over. Right. So I, I'm not going to make you tell the whole story, but you were in ROTC and the leader gave a directive and asked a question and said, how would we do this? How would we solve this problem? How? Yeah, it, it was it, it was the uh, infantry. I was in the Corps of ROTC and uh, engineers. Now I've been a Corps of Engineers, and 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 but everybody carries a rifle, so we had learned some infantry tactics. And the question was, you know, you're you're down at the bottom of a hill. The enemy is in the house at the top of the hill. How are you going to take the house and get rid of the enemy? And everybody came up with this fantastic ideas. And, and finally, the, the captain who was teaching the class said, no, there's only one right answer to that question. And everybody went, really? What? It all depends on the situation and the terrain. I and that's and that's what it is. I mean, you know, service is like that, and and manufacturing is like that. Uh, there's no, you you can't plan every situation and what you're going to do. You put you just train yourself to be able to understand the variables mm -hmm. and figure out how to solve them in real time. And I love it. And actually, service is more complicated on an interrupt-driven basis than manufacturing. And you just you know, somebody says to an engineer, you know, "Go to Allison's house because she's having problems with the heating unit." Okay, that's all they tell you, and you get in your van and you go, and then you open the door, and what's the problem? Well, my basement's flooded. So how do I you know, restart the heater? Oh God, I should have known that. I would have brought a pump, you know. It, it's, <laughs> but, but that's what it is all the time. It's it's always surprises. Yes. So being prepared and being adaptable are two key Absolutely. points. Absolutely. Um, and I love so getting back to hiring the field service manager. I I particularly loved in one of your videos you talk about that you know, just the best salesperson that's in house that happens to be right in front of you may doesn't always make the best manager. And I think you just touched on that earlier for a couple of those reasons, right? You've got to have multiple skills just because you're outgoing and you're a good salesperson doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to make a good service manager. So that's important. Absolutely. It also and, doesn't. It doesn't. It also doesn't mean that they're going to be a good sales manager either. Right. Right. So I think you you recommend looking for someone with some managerial experience. Yep. And one of the things, well, actually, two things that you mention 
that are really important are the onboarding process for this person yep. and a long range plan. Yes. I, I, the onboarding, I mean, onboarding, anytime someone crosses the boundary from outside your organization to inside, you, you need to know what you're going to do with them and how you're going to get them where they, they need to go. And that starts off with employees and then it broadens out to customers. So you have to onboard customers to mm -hmm. your business. And so, so, but the onboarding process requires you, the hiring person, to think about what you want them to do, to think about your culture of your organization, to think about how things actually happen. You know, there's, there's this tribal knowledge, and, yeah. and this, this tribal knowledge technically, and this tribal knowledge culturally. So, yeah, if you think about how um, people talk to each other, and, and you know, the, the people tell you how to do it right, and you, you, know, you don't interrupt. When somebody comes with a suggestion, you don't say, uh, no, but. You say, yes, but. You know, things like that. But all organizations have their own quirks. And... The sooner the new folk understand them and internalize them, the sooner they're more productive. Yes. Yes. Excellent advice. Um, another thing that you recommend, and I think this is so smart, is sending them to an industry trade show, sending yep. them to public service meetings, and keep them educated. How many people hire a service manager probably don't have a stellar onboarding program, Right. probably don't have a solid long range plan, and then definitely don't give them the education and support that they need. I think that's called throwing a guy in the in water and just turn him, <laughs> yeah. go, turn him across the ocean, buddy. Yeah. Baptism by fire. Go. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I, I think, so I know that in the in the sales and marketing side, there's a lot of discussion about are trade shows valuable. Mm -hmm. And I, I I can't comment on that because I've not been in the, really into that part of the world. But from the service people's perspective, and especially the head of service, they were invaluable. It gives them a chance to meet salespeople who come from around the country or around the world, as opposed to just the ones that are in the same building. So they broaden their net network and they build some relationships and mutual trust. Uh, they can go out and not only see their equipment in operation, but they see other people's equipment in operation. They can go over and talk with folks and pick their brain and 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 learn and and very quickly broaden their knowledge and thought processes about how things work. And lastly, they get to see customers. Because you go to a trade show, the sales guy just book demos to try to fill up the day. And some of them are prospects, some of those are customers that have some legacy equipment and it, trying to sell upgrades on new products. Mm -hmm. And that's that's an opportunity for a head of service to meet customers in what is usually a non-confrontational situation. Mm, Something like breaks, that. you send an engineer in, you have problems, you send the head of service in to, to take the bullet and, you know, but that's confrontational. So if you can start doing these relationships at a non-confrontational level, that that really gets the process going. They get to talk with customers about how they're using the equipment, what they're trying to achieve, what outcomes they're looking for, 
how satisfied are they? You know, they're gonna. You can do a satisfaction survey without having a pencil and paper, just mm-hmm. talking, asking the right questions, and watching their face. And are they shaking their head or not? And and yeah, that's free relationship building and training for everybody. Yes. Yes. Mm. We can talk more about that at another time. You piqued my my interest. Um, and and we're running towards the end here. I want to make sure we talk quickly about choosing or and or supporting uh, your field service rep. Right. How do you design the best or a or a ideal field service rep? And one thing that you recommend is starting with a pilot program. What does that look like to you? What does that mean for someone? Well, if you're going to make a change, right? you have a service organization today, and if you have a weak leader that's getting replaced, and that's why we went through that hiring process just now, um, if you're going to make a change, you can't do it. You should. You can, but you shouldn't do it all at once. You, know, you should try it first. A prototype. Yeah, you, know, you build a machine. Your first thing to do is is prototype it. Right. Make sure it works. Make sure you can build it. You can take it apart. You know, do all that. But you need to do the same thing with the organization. Um, I I think that Pareto's law really works in service. That. 20% of the, the energy and, and the knowledge and the enthusiasm, uh, 20% of those people create 80% of the enthusiasm, the training, the knowledge. They know what's going on and, and they know how things work and they know what customers want because customer groups are different from product to product, industry to industry. So right. you could have the same product in three different industries, and they had three different expectations of your, your service organization. So yeah. you only have a couple of people that know. So so what you got to do is you don't design it yourself. You, you get them together, get some beers, and just design, you know, tell them, this is what my objective is. My vision is. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, pretty close. But you know, what about this? And what? And and it becomes it doesn't become a top down. It becomes a side to side. Mm. Everybody working together, and and that's what you want. Uh, and it's and, the field service manager who we're talking about who's having this right. He's he he or she are doing it with their more the most senior technical people. Okay. Yeah, they're facilitating it, but yes. And, and the service guys know what works and what doesn't work, and they really understand it. Right? And I can give you a quick talk, a quick summary. Yeah. I I took over one organization. I had a bunch of guys that were there forever, and they're still there. You know, 20 years later, they're still there. But I, I said to my one, one of my more my junior, but high growth potential. You could just see it in him. And I said, "What? Who do you call when you're stuck?" Because we, at the, when I took over, we didn't have a good service uh, help desk. We didn't have good tech support. So I said, "Who do you call?" And he said, "Well, if I need to get it fixed immediately, because the customer is going ballistic." I call Steve, but if I have time to really learn and understand and maybe make myself a little better, I call Dita, because Dita tells me, do this, and if this doesn't work, then do this, and if by the time the third or fourth choice comes, I know we solved the problem, where Steve would always say, just do this, just change this thing and get out, you know? Yeah. And, and, and so... Yeah, they understand all this stuff, and and they understand the dynamics. Well, that that makes so much sense. I love the simple art 
of asking a good question. Yeah. Right? Right. And I think sometimes we forget to do that. Just you, you, want to hear, you want to hear my best one? Yeah. So I had it after I took over this organization, a couple of months later, I got everybody together. I brought them in from around the country and and I, 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 we did it on a Friday afternoon and sent them home on Sunday. And the first day I was telling them this about me and this is what I believe and this is what we're trying to do and all these kind of things. A good discussion for the day. And at the end of it, I, I just, and I hadn't planned to do this. I just looked at them. I said, how many of you guys have kids? Everybody raises their hand. How many of you are working because you need to put bread on the table and plan for college? Everybody puts their hand up. Right? What do you do if the products never fail? And it was silence. <laughs> and this crazy, scary-eyed look. And I said, it's not happening today, and it won't happen in five years, but it will happen eventually that the rate of failures will be so small that your your service work will be minimal. What are you going to do? And I, now go go off, have dinner, think about it. We'll talk tomorrow. And the next day, one of the guys says, "Holy crap! That you're right. It could happen. What do we do?" I said, "Well, you know, it's up to you to get. You know, I will pay for your tra schooling and training." But you got to figure out how you're going to make that, make the time, and how you're going to do it. And it turns out that like there were probably ten guys, and maybe two left, and the other right now are applications engineers, part of the sales department, and they're the technical folks that go with the salespeople on sales calls, and the salesmen know how to sell, but they don't know the technical side of everything. And these, my guys, were now at tech support you know, applications, they said, okay, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to measure? What are you trying to accomplish? Okay, and talk to them to configure the product in real time. And that's what they did. So that, to me, was the best question I ever came up with. That's fantastic. Well, and, and just, we've got to end, but the last part of... Uh, recommendation that you had in your video that I, I really loved is you talked about certifications. Yes. And I think you just kind of touched on that of let's just quickly, what does that mean? It means I believe that everybody dealing with customers, whatever their role should be doing whatever they do in a way that's been defined by the company and do it the same way. And certainly when you're doing service, you have to f follow a rigid path. Well, not really rigid, but a, a path. Mm -hmm. And you understand that. So you have to know that. You have to be qualified to do that. And that qualification is really a certification process. You go through training, uh, hands-on experience. What we used to do is put them in manufacturing for a month, pick new guys, Sent them to England, we, we were based, put them in manufacturing, let them learn how to build the product, how to test it. And then they came back and then we did more training in our facility and then sent them out with the more experienced people. But at the end of the process, we knew that they knew how to do their job pretty much and they knew when they didn't and who to call. And that's the certification I'm talking about. And I think everybody needs to do it. I think sales guys need to do it. You know, you know, you know, you want them to present the product in a certain way. Somebody's got to train them, but somebody then has to make sure they're doing it. Right. And that's all the certification at the end of the process. Yeah, we trust you to go out and sell our products. Well, sir, you are a wealth of information. And I feel like I'm, I've been schooled and, and I mean that in just such a lovely way. Thank you. And part of the reason, by the way, is I felt intimidated by super, by Wonder Girl. 
Wonder Woman, my friend. Wonder Woman, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a small one. On my she screen. is always here. <laughs> okay, yeah. That's but no, we, we can learn so much from you if you listening or watching this are not already connected with Sam on LinkedIn. Please reach out and do that. He has an amazing blog that I highly recommend you subscribe to. And there's just, there's an endless amount of information and frameworks and structures that you can learn from Sam. So thank you so much for spending some time with me and our listeners today. I appreciate you. And I appreciate the opportunity, Allison. This this was fun. <laughs> this wasn't work. This wasn't work. This was fun. We have a lot of fun out here. And I just want to say to our manufacturers and everyone listening and watching this, we appreciate you. We know you have so many choices of how you can spend your time. And I just want to uh, congratulate you for investing a little time in yourself and your business today. And thank you because we do appreciate you. Thanks. I appreciate it very much. All right, everybody. We'll if you're not time. already, subscribe to the Manufacturing Masters podcast on Apple Music or Spotify. And for a deeper dive, head on over to manufacturing-masters.com. It's everything they never taught you in school.